Pete Fatter from Wharton. Uh, Pete, thanks for, for being there again. And um, stage is yours. And then we'll have the Q&A. And I'm sure that will be uh, interesting as usual. Thanks, Great. Pete. Great. Thanks, Laura. Uh, it's a, a pleasure for me to, to be with you all. Uh, uh, you know, Laurent was being uh, modest uh, that, yes, I've been doing the same thing for the 20 years since I've known him. But it's actually I'm finishing my 33rd year on the Wharton faculty. So I'm much older than you think. Um, and really doing the same thing over all that time, which is just predicting customer behavior, trying to predict how many customers will we acquire and how long will they stay with us until they leave and how many purchases will they make over that horizon and how much money will we make off of those purchases? That, that's the stuff that I do. Uh, for most of the 33 years, people have said, eh, that's nice, but I have a business to run, leave me alone. Uh, but things have been changing recently uh, there's been much more interest in the kinds of questions that I've been asking, much more interest in answering them, much more interest in taking those answers and weaving them in, not just to day-to-day -day marketing tactics, but to big, broad, long-term strategy. And that's what I want to talk about. And in particular, the whole COVID crisis has been just, I think, a, a really a great opportunity for firms to step back and say, wait a minute now is the time for us to start uh, changing our strategies and, and, and such. So, so let me give you a specific example. So um, I, I, unlike most of you probably, um, I eat out all the time. I don't know if you'd recognize any of these, these apps or not, some of you surely will. Um, my refrigerator is empty. So, so every day I, you know, I, I pull out the phone and I decide, okay, where am I gonna eat uh, lunch or dinner? Um, and uh, so on one hand, that's nothing new. I've always done that. But on the other hand, the fact that I'm ordering through the phone, doing it through the apps, that is different. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, these companies all of a sudden know a lot more about me than they ever did before. Because before I would just walk up to the counter, order my food, give them cash. There's no way that they could track that. But now everything can be tracked. And so you can look at these questions over here and, and to me, these are really kinds of interesting questions that I've always been focused on and I think every business should be, whether it's food or not. In fact, whether it's good times or bad times, because we can ask the same thing, as you can see on the bottom bullet here, uh, when our sales are going way down, we should be asking ourselves, why are the sales going down? Is it because we're acquiring fewer customers or they're not staying as long with us, they're purchasing less often, they're spending less? So anytime there's a change, good or bad, we should be breaking it down into these kinds of behavioral issues, not just to understand the nature of that change, but then to run our business differently. Now, before I go on, let me tell you what I'm not going to cover, because I bet some of you have done some marketing stuff, you, you know, you've thought about some issues like these, and I bet that a lot of you think, you know where I'm going, and I'm not, okay? I am not going there. You know, there's, there's all too many marketers out there who say, let's take all of that rich, delicious, tasty data and figure out exactly which email to send to that person and exactly which kind of product to recommend to that person over there. I'm not talking about any of that kind of stuff. You know, it turns out that that stuff, a lot of that one-to-one -one hyper personalization doesn't work very well. Even in the best of times, I think its effectiveness is overrated. And especially at a time like this, where not only is it kind of inappropriate, but it's even less likely that that stuff is going to work. So the question is, what, you know, what, what am I talking about? So, uh, so if we're going to take all that rich, delicious data, but it's not just a matter of uh, all this hyper-personalized stuff, this is what I want to talk about over here, customer centricity. And again, those words by themselves are kind of ambiguous. Uh, so let me first in a casual way and then a little bit more formally tell you what I'm talking about. You can read these words for yourself. Okay, I should have given them to you in, in French. I'm sorry, but uh, English is all I got. Uh, but what I want to do, because you look at these words, what I want to do is to emphasize some of them, to really point out how what I'm talking about is different from 
what you might think I'm talking about. So, so emphasis number one on the words widely vary. You know, it turns out that, that when you look at the data, customers are incredibly different from each other. It, nothing offends me more than when people talk about the customer when people develop uh, you know, strategy and tactics just to see how broadly appealing they'll be. No, not all customers are created equal. And to some marketers, that's a nuisance. That's a pain. That's a hassle. Like, oh my goodness, we're going to have to have different versions of the message for different customers. It's a cost. It's a complexity. But to me, it's an opportunity. To me, the fact that not all customers are the same gives us a chance to figure out who the best ones are. Well, anyway, I'm gonna say more about that. Point number two is when we talk about the differences, I'm not necessarily talking about the words that they use. I'm not necessarily talking about their attitudes. I'm not necessarily talking about where they're located in the social network. I have nothing against those ideas, but I don't wanna start with any of them. I wanna start with behavior because you know that nothing predicts future behavior better than past behavior. And so I'm, I want to be as behavioral as possible. I want to squeeze as much insight out of what people are actually doing. And then layer on the social media and layer on the marketing messaging and the, all that other stuff. But I want to begin with behavior. And then here comes bold challenge number three. I don't want to just make this a marketing thing. I just don't, I, I, as much as I am a marketing professor and want to improve marketing practices, I don't want to stop there. I want to make the entire organization to be laser focused on these ideas. And that's difficult. And I have a lot more to say about that. But I want to find as much relevance, as much buy-in from the CFO, from the COO, from the folks in R&D, from the folks operating the supply chain and, and talent management. I want everybody to be thinking about these differences across the customers and how understanding and leveraging those differences can help them run their part of the business more effectively. So these are in casual terms, the, the, the words that I'm using. Uh, a little bit more specifically, some of you may know, maybe not, that I started writing these books on customer centricity. Uh, and in fact, um, I, I, gotta, um, I, I gotta give you a message right here. I gotta ask you all a favor. Is this, uh, you see at the bottom of the screen, that's book number one, came out about 10 years ago. Well, I just learned today that uh, the new version of it is out. Um, and so uh, it, it's, pre it's pretty much the same as the old. So if you've already read the old one, fine, don't bother. But if you're intrigued by these ideas, okay, I want you to go to Amazon and I want you to buy this book. And here's why, not because they make no money on it, but um, the problem is the old version of the book sold so well, I think it sold like 60, 70,000 copies of it. That, that it's still coming in above the new version. So I want you to buy the new version, the one with the big circle on the cover, just came out today, as far as I know. Buy the new one so we can bring it to the, whatever. Anyway, you can see these words over here, uh, defining customer centricity, uh, more formal definition. And, and again, I, I, you can read these words for yourself and I'm looking to see where your eyes are going. And right away, your eyes are zooming in on that idea of having a select set of customers. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of questions you might have about that. You know, what do you mean by that? Uh, and what about everybody else? And, and if we had time, I can answer all of those questions. It's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. But the main question is, you know, what do you mean by that select set? And once again, I'm gonna come back to behavior and we're gonna use those three letters or that three letter acronym that Laurent uh, uh, described before, customer lifetime value. See, this is the thing, the main thing that I've been doing for those 20 years uh, si since we first met. Uh, and I'm very, very serious about this. The models work superbly well. Like I said before, if I could predict how long you're gonna stay as a customer, how often you're gonna interact with me over that horizon, how much you're gonna spend when you do, add all that up, project it forward, boom. It works really well. And this is part of the frustration that I've been having for 20 odd years, because I've been going to companies and saying, here are these tools, okay? The model works really, really well. Here, here's some stuff to read, here's some R code, here's some spreadsheets, here's some videos, use it. And companies have been very hesitant. Companies don't understand, companies don't trust it, companies think that it doesn't apply to them, and it does. 
And so I've been really pushing these ideas. And I really think that the COVID crisis, as I said before, is a very important time to look at the customers who are buying from you and, and ask that question. Are we losing the high value customers? Or are we losing the flighty bargain hunters? We're better off without them anyway. It's important to understand how lifetime value varies across the customer base and how that changes over time. That to me is the center of what every company should be doing. Uh, as Laurent said, uh, I actually uh, am frustrated by the uh, kind of unwillingness of, of companies just to adopt these models. I took matters into my own hands about five years ago and founded a company called Zodiac, where we brought these models to life at full commercial scale. And it was awesome. It was really great. Worked with a variety of retailers and pharmaceutical firms and telecommunication firms and gaming and hospitality and entertainment, wide variety of firms all around the world to let them get the lifetime value numbers, to let them understand what it all means and to let them take action. So here's just a screenshot from Zodiac. And, and if you look in the middle here, you can see this is the distribution of lifetime value. And you have two reactions to it. Uh, well, it may, maybe more than two. Reaction number one, um, what will it look like for my business? And the answer is, you're looking at it. <laughs> that I've run these models for thousands of different businesses now. And it always looks like this. Now, exactly how far out the bars are and how high they are, of course, that will vary. But the basic shape here is anything but the normal distribution that you might have expected. There's nothing normal about customer behavior. And I really, really mean that. You got a bunch of customers who are eh, so-so, they're one and done, they buy from us maybe once a year, but then you get this bar on the right, okay? And you start asking questions about them. You start saying, what's up with them? You know, what else can I be doing with them? How do they use my products and services differently than other customers? And how can I acquire more like them? So when I come back to the books that I've written, Again, this is the old cover. Don't buy this version, buy the new one. <laughs> um, the title is ambiguous. The title doesn't mean anything to anyone. Customer centricity. But it's the subtitle. That's what I've been trying to get across. Focus on the right customers for strategic advantage. And who are the right customers? Because this, this can be a very dangerous issue, especially these days. It's nothing to do with the color of someone's skin. It has nothing to do with their income or their zip code, or even what country they live in. It has to do with customer lifetime value. So, so we want to use a, a strict, very objective definition of it. And if we can figure out what makes them different and how to find more like them, we can make more money. We can make more money in a sustainable, ethical, defendable way, instead of just trying to aim for that mythical average customer who either doesn't exist or isn't that valuable. So that's Zodiac. If you notice, I've been talking in the past tense about it because Zodiac is no more, but it's for a good reason. Because two years ago, Nike bought the company. Uh, and this was a wonderful outcome in so many ways. Number one, it was just a great financial outcome. But number two, what an incredible validation. All of these people, all of these companies who for years were saying, oh, well, that's, that's a nice academic thing, but you don't understand my business. All of a sudden, when they see a company like Nike going in there and buying a company like this from a position of power, not desperation, say, we're doing well, we could be doing even better. And we really want to understand our customers at a granular level in order to do so. So, so it was really, really great. And it got a lot of other companies to start saying, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe we should be doing the customer centricity and the customer lifetime value thing. Uh, so that, that's, that, it, it's been really terrific to really move the conversation ahead and bring some credibility to it that nothing that I could say or do would ever match what, what, what Nike can. Uh, now, I'm giving you the wrong idea though. I'm making it sound easier than it really is. See, and, and I'll admit my own naivete. I will admit to you that when I was pushing on these models, I used to be saying, hey, listen, if you can figure out the lifetime value thing, if you can wave the magic wand, then money will come raining down from the sky. Just like that. It's not that easy. And it turns out that no matter how good your data are, no matter how good your technical sophistication or your buy-in on lifetime value, that's not going to get the job done. And this has been one of the big learnings for me. It's not a technical thing. 
It's every bit as much a language thing, a culture thing, an organizational design thing. It's really, really, really hard and vital to get buy-in from every other part of the organization instead of just having to focus on this kind of marketing toy over here. Uh, so that's been a, a lot of learning for me because I'm just a quant guy. I just want to run models. Um, and so in looking around, I've seen a number of best practices. For instance, here's a great book by a gentleman uh, named Jay Galbraith uh, called Designing the Customer-Centric Organization. I don't know how well you can see it on your screen, uh, and, and I'm very happy to, to send you a copy of this and the whole deck if you're interested. Um, if you look at the middle column, the description of a traditional product-centric enterprise, there's nothing interesting about it. It's like looking in the mirror. That's probably the way that you run your company. You obsess over the products and services that you develop. You obsess over metrics like market share. If you look at the mental, uh, the mental process at the bottom of it, it's this idea of, hey, we're really good at delivering a certain kind of product or service. What else can we spin off of that? What new products can we develop or what new markets can we take them to? But now look at the column on the right, completely different. And this is the challenge, this is the difficulty, the opportunity of customer centricity. You are going to run your company completely differently. You're not gonna build the company around the different products, you're gonna build it around the customers. You're gonna say, hey, there's that green spike on the right, those really valuable customers. Let's manage those customers. Let's figure out what kinds of products and services they want to buy and we'll develop them, we'll find them, we'll partner with other organizations, even if we're not making any money on it. It really is this idea of convergent thinking. We have these valuable customers over here. What can we bring to them in order to enhance their value and attract more like them? So I want you to look at these two columns and realize this is tricky. You know, how do we do this? So I've spent a lot of time thinking about that in the last couple of years. And I have a surprise for you. What I have found is that the best way to get the conversation started isn't through marketing. You know what? I can win over marketing easy enough. Okay, they, they understand what I'm saying. They appreciate it. But the problem is once I went over the CMO, then she goes to the rest of the organization and they say, oh, that's just marketing. This is just the flavor of the month. Who knows what they're doing? The key isn't to start with marketing. The key is to start with finance. And then let's be practical about it. If I can win over the CFO, then the rest of the organization will fall like dominoes and I will win over marketing and operations and R&D and, and everything else. And here's how we do it. Customer-based corporate valuation. If you think about the, the kinds of data and the kinds of questions that I was talking about earlier, how many customers are we going to acquire? How long are they going to stay? How much are they going to interact with us? What will they spend? If you take all of those things and project them out and add them up, well, that's all of our cash flow. <laughs> and if I can project the cash flow out into the future, and if I can do it far, and if I can do it accurately, I'm talking about the overall value of the organization. So even if you don't care about which email we're gonna to send to which person at which time, even if you're just a straight finance person, that's something you wanna know. And so we're gonna build the same exact models that I've been building for decades for marketing purposes. We're gonna build the same models, but we're gonna use them for financial purposes to help project and understand future cash flow. And that is the nature of my new startup, Theta Equity Partners. And we are revolutionizing finance through customer-based corporate valuation. Keeping in mind that I'm a marketing professor and recognizing that this is a means to an end, that if I can win over finance, I can win over marketing and the rest of the company too. So it's been super fascinating. Again, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Don't take stock tips from a marketing professor, but it's been really fascinating to look at public or private companies through our lens of marketing to be able to make statements about them and their future that are more accurate, more meaningful, more actionable than what the finance people would be talking about. I'm not gonna get into all the details about it. If you're interested, I mean, here's one case study, uh, which I, I find heartwarming. Uh, we looked at Lyft, the ride share company that many of you would be familiar with. Um, and if you look, we, we, when Lyft announced its IPO, they gave us just, not us, but they published just enough data for us to reverse engineer and come up with their distribution of lifetime values. 
which looked exactly like the Zodiac one that I showed you before. It's just that there, that big right spike is way, 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 way out there, which is good. So very heterogeneous customer base, some really valuable customers. But when you take into account all the other accounting and finance stuff, the overhead, the fixed costs, it's terrible. The company was grossly overvalued. Uh, and I just, and I like to show this one off, not only because it was a really fun analysis, but because the Financial Times, when the Financial Times, the Bible of finance, comes down and says that the best analysis, in our opinion, was done by, well, a couple of marketing professors. <laughs> yeah, that's really, really, really good. Uh, uh, the, the recent Harvard Business Review, uh, the, the first issue of, of 2020, uh, we had an article about how to value a company by analyzing its customers by Dan McCarthy, my co-founder and myself. And that article was a companion to this other one over here by Rob Markey, a name that you may or may not recognize, but some of you do. He's a, a partner at Bain Consulting. He's the net promoter score guy, right? He's the guy who's really pushing all the NPS stuff. And he fully agrees with everything that we're talking about. The companies are undervaluing their customers. And then we really need to look at customer metrics, who's buying what when, in addition to, you know, would you recommend us, NPS, uh, in order to really understand the business. Um, here's a link to, the, to those uh, HBR articles. And if you're interested, if you look at those letters down there, HBR, FASB, FASB. Well, I'm sure many of you recognize those letters. That's the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And Dan and myself and Rob Markey uh, have been uh, writing letters to FASB and they've been listening, saying, listen, it's just wrong that companies aren't disclosing these kinds of customer metrics. If, if, if companies really want their stakeholders and investors to understand what's going on, really important to have this kind of information out there. Now, this is early stages in that revolution. I am not predicting that all of these metrics will be disclosed on a regular basis next year or five years from now. But, you know, 20 years from now, I think we're going to see much more disclosure and much more smart activity tying together what finance is doing with what marketing is doing. Let me wrap it up here. Um, you know, usually I ask a whole bunch of questions about customer centricity, about some of the challenges in doing it and whether you should be doing it at all. But let me just close by, instead of focusing on those questions, putting them back in the context of the COVID crisis. Uh, and I'll just, just kind of br bring these up real fast. Going right back to where I started saying, can we look at the new sources of data that are coming from COVID or the losses in revenue that are coming from COVID and use that as either an opportunity or a necessity to really start looking at our customers differently and, and, and understanding them and using them to, to, to run our business more effectively and making the investments in uh, the, these kinds of insights and actions. Uh, and I'll be real honest with you. I'm not happy with what I've been seeing. If you see the link that I just put at the bottom of the page, this is an interview that I did just last week, uh, basically expressing my um, shame, my, my regret about how badly marketers have handled the COVID crisis in lots of different ways, but in particular, as dealing with these kinds of issues. I can't tell you how many companies I've worked with where the crisis happens, it's time to let people go. Who are the first people to let go? It's all those nerds and data science. We don't need them. We have to figure out how to get curbside pickup going. Big mistake companies. This is the opportunity to learn and get better, um, not just to you know, cut our ability to learn. So I'm gonna leave it at that. There's my last slide. If any of you are intrigued, if any of you are interested, stay in touch with me. You know, I'm very happy to connect on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, again, if you're interested in seeing some of these case studies where we appeal to finance, but we're really talking to the marketers, you can check out some of the content at uh, Theta Equity as well. And then there's these, these books talking about what do we mean by customer centricity and how do we do it. I am going to stop there. I'm going to um, stop sharing my slides. I will turn things back to Laurent um, and to all of you. I would love to get your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, uh, obviously interesting. Um, and I will um, very much, you know, we have the chance to have Pete for at least another 15, 20 minutes um, per se. Uh, so um, 
and we are very, we're a small group, so if there are any, any questions that um, you want to ask uh, directly to Pete, uh, please feel free to step in. You can unmute yourself, uh, put your, your, your mic on, your, um, your camera on, and you can have a face-to-face -face interaction uh, with Pete. Um, uh, if, if anything, I know that there were, you know, there was one question asked by Guillaume. Uh, Guillaume, you know, I guess Pete, you were probably yeah. The question from yeah. Well, let me it's let me jump in and talk about that. That's a that's yeah. a it's a great one. It's it's first yeah. of all, it's a natural question that a lot of people would be thinking about. First, let me give you a little bit of an ad. Um, if you look on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter, if you search my name, you'll see um, there's uh, something called the great marketing growth debate that is gonna start next week. And the MMA, which used to be the Mobile Marketing Association in the US, has put together four thought leaders, if I don't know if I count as one of them, to talk about their theories, their perspectives on how to achieve marketing growth. I'm giving the kickoff talk next week, and then a couple of weeks later, it's gonna be Byron Sharp uh, talking about some of his activities. So, uh, so it's a natural thing to, to think about. And I have the strangest answer for you. So I'm, I'm really glad to elaborate on it. Um, I have tre not, a, a tremendous respect for what Byron is doing. And of course, the guy who started all of that, Andrew Ehrenberg. Um, yeah. I, I am probably their biggest advocate in, in all of North America. Um, and 80% of what Byron is saying in his book, How Brands Grow, is right on target. And if you don't know it, don't even buy my book, buy his book instead. It's actually probably more informative. But there is that other 20% where we differ. In other words, my models are built, are, are exactly the same as his, but then I add an extra layer to them <clears throat> that, that accounts for differences in customer behavior over time. And that extra layer makes a big difference. Uh, and that extra layer helps sort out customers. Back to my, the diagrams I was showing you. Uh, and so actually, I really do believe with Byron that it's important to get the word out there broadly and you wanna have penetration and, that the, and the idea of double jeopardy, that penetration and mm -hmm. purchase frequency go together. I believe all of those things, but having said that, those really good customers are even better, are, are way, way better than he would give credit for. So when you're running your business, you wanna do it in two ways. You want to do all the things that I was talking about already, which is let's figure out who those best customers are. Let's double down on them. Let's find more customers like them. But at the same time, they're just a small fraction of the business. Uh, at least they're a small fraction of the customer base. And so it's very important to follow a lot of the Byron Sharp type strategies in order to maintain as much health out of that part of the customer base and to always be fishing around looking for other even more valuable customers. So I have this, this interesting love-hate relationship with, with that work. But it's very important to know it, and it's very important to subscribe to most of those principles. Really, really good question. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Guillaume, for the question. Uh, do you have any? Other, do we have any other questions in the room? Don't be shy. I can. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you may have questions. If not, I will step in. But please feel free to to uh, to step in. Hello. Hello, Peter. This is uh, Christoph. Hey, Christophe. I'm very happy to have the chance to uh, listen to you and to see you today. Um, I just had a question here. So I'm based in, in Paris, France. And over here, you know, people just uh, more and more say that to be customer-centric, you need to be first employee-centric. Um, in that way, would you say that, for instance, Amazon is still a customer-centric company for you? No, okay. A two excellent points there. So let me, let me elaborate on both. Uh, first of all, I would not say that Amazon is, is customer centric, um, even though that's their tagline, the most customer centric company on the earth or whatever they say, it's not true. I mean, I'm not saying they're not customer centric, but their main strategy is all about efficiency. Let's just get stuff out there as broadly, cheaply, quickly as possible. Uh, and, and all the things that they do for efficiency, and they do that incredibly well, will enhance some of the customer centric aspects, but that's, but that's not what they're all about. They're, they're really kind of more of, of an efficiency firm than a customer centric firm. They're really not doing a lot. I mean, who, no one knows what Amazon does, they're very private, but they're not doing nearly as much with uh, um, 
lifetime value and really focusing on certain kinds of customers uh, as much as, well, I, I'd like them to be. So number one, I, I, as much as I admire Amazon and, and despite it not being their focus, they've kind of raised the bar for everyone else. But to your other point, Christophe, boy, is that a good one. Um, yeah, uh, as I said before, I'm kind of naive. And I always figured, man, if I just have my lifetime value stuff, we'll have success. Uh, and it's difficult. And, and, and you got to get the organization-wide buy-in, which means employee centricity as well. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, someone who's done some amazing work on this front is a gentleman by the name of Michael Lowenstein. So he's written actually a number of books, first kind of on my type of thing, which is not all customers are created equal and blah, 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 blah. So he's been saying that as long as I have. But more recently, he, he has come to that exact same realization, Christophe, and he's been saying, uh, yeah, and it's great. Yeah, we want to understand the difference across our customers, but we also really want to understand the difference across our employees and to try to find ways to have the right interactions with them and to understand the differences across them. Uh, it's a really good point. I will claim no expertise about it. Uh, that's why I'm talking about the work of, of Michael Lowenstein and others, uh, but it, it is really, really essential. And last thing, the basic patterns that we see for customer lifetime value for, you know, for, for customer goodness, they didn't come up with some metric of employee goodness, let's say employee tenure or something like that. It's going to look the same way. So the basic patterns of how long customers stay with us and how long employees stay with us, same thing. So there's a lot of companies applying my same kinds of models in the employee setting. Uh, and, and it works well and can give you the same kind of insights and can help bring that kind of alignment that I'm always striving for. So thank you, Christoph. Re really excellent point. Thank you, Christoph. Um, and thanks a bit uh, for the insights. Um, any additional questions um, from the audience? Okay. Uh, but I have a question. Um, oh, how do we, we have one, Lee? Yes. Thank you, Peter. I did have a question in trying to under, better understand the relationship between customers and the context in which they take decisions. In the introduction to your speech, you placed your arguments on customer centricity in the context of the current crisis. Two questions that flow from there whether customer behavior is immutable in time or whether it depends on the decision environment in which they are taking decisions. We could suggest today that perhaps the crisis is a crisis in the perce perception of risk and certainty and ambiguity in which we're taking decisions moving forward. And will that impact how we look at our customers and how we take decisions within the organization? And then second, we can suggest that perhaps the notion of customer value is dependent upon the context and whether we're doing descriptive, prescriptive, or predictive analytics, we will have different options in how we nudge customers to look at different ways at value. The two questions, wanting to have your thoughts on that. Wow, you guys are great. Laurent, thank you for pulling such a great group together. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Lee. Great question. Sure. Uh, so let, so let me uh, answer them in reverse order. Uh, so you're absolutely right that the, my kind of description and definition of lifetime value was, was a bit limited. Uh, I was focusing purely on financial. And there's so many situations where that's either incomplete or maybe just wrong. So for instance, if I'm working with a pharmaceutical firm and I do lots of work with them, it, it would be dangerous, it would be unethical if we simply said, you know, who are the customers, patients or physicians who are bringing us the most money? And we need to look at, at other kinds of factors like adherence and compliance to therapy, you know, lives lengthened and not just money extracted. So it's, it's very important uh, to look at, at the full picture. Now, having said that, let me be crass and come right back to the almighty dollar, that that should be on the list in, in most cases. And in some cases, it might be the only factor. But in, but in lots of other situations, we'd be looking for some metric of engagement uh, in addition to dollars spent. We might be looking for you know, referrals and, and, and so on. It might not immediately translate as dollars, but can be equally powerful. 
Um, so, so yes, 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 we should have a broader definition. And I'm going to get to your other question in a second. But here's the problem with it. And so I'm all, I'm all in favor of it. But, but here's the, the, the problem. It's so much easier to measure dollars. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, it's a universal thing. We have really good systems for that. Whereas if we start to measure engagement and influence and even adherence and compliance, uh, sometimes those can get a little bit fuzzy. And so it's harder to make apples to apples comparisons, even within a company across its different business units or its different geographies. Because if we start bringing in attitudinal measures, there might be some response bias. It might just be different in how people answer questions in Thailand versus Turkey. So I want to bring that other stuff in, but it's just harder to do so quite as cleanly and objectively as dollars. So that's, that's uh, the, the first part, but you're right. An expanded definition makes sense. And very often when I'm working with companies, they will insist on it. And as long as they can bring us those metrics, we'll bring them into the model. Um, having said all that, let's go back to, to your first question now. Even if you have an expanded, more context-enriched definition of lifetime value, the basic picture that I showed you, that most customers are, eh, and then there's this kind of spike of customers of really highly engaged ones, that tends to be fairly universal. And even as we go through the COVID crisis, and I'm, I, you know, there's a lot of people, you were sort of implying this in your question, that are saying, the world is changing forever. And I'm saying, nah, it's not. I mean, I kind of am, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm saying it's not because I am willing to bet you or anyone else that two years from now, five years from now, when we look at the distribution of lifetime value, it's still going to be the same. Um, so I think that, that those distributions, the idea that most customers are eh, and some customers are awesome, uh, and that they're different from the others, and we should build a business around them, I think that part's universal. Now, of course, who's in that spike on the right and what it is that they seek from us, that could change. There's no question about it. And the COVID crisis is a perfect opportunity for us to look at our best customers pre-COVID and, and say, what is it that we can and should be doing for them under the crisis? Uh, and, and so it's really a chance to really deepen the relationships with those best customers and acquire more like them. So that's why I've been saying from the beginning, it's a compelling uh, aspect of COVID that very, very few companies have really taken advantage of. I understand why, you know, it's crisis management. We just got to sell stuff. But now that things are starting to sell, settle down a little bit, we should be looking to see how our, our best customers' needs have changed and respond to them instead of just saying, what stuff can we sell to a lot of people? So there, there you go, Lee. I, I hope that that makes some sense. Thank you. I will reflect on that. Thanks. Great, sure thing. Excellent Thank question. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, and actually, to build on, on the, um, the, 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 the point, uh, our previous guest was uh, Kuhn Powells uh, with a speech around uh, marketing investment during, during crisis time. So along this line, we did touch base and refer, reference to some, uh, some, some work on, you know, shall we be running promotion during that crisis time and which kind of customers should, will actually benefit from that? And I'm mentioning that to everyone and to Lee specifically, there is a replay available uh, where, you know, where you can go on the Coffee and Learn channel on YouTube where you might find insights. And again, you know, I'll be more than happy to follow up on some of the, the things that uh, Kuhn has been touching, uh, touching on. And let me just uh, so. comment on that. Uh, Kuhn Powell's is, is, is wonderful. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad to be, you know, following him. He's a great scholar, thinks all the time about practical issues. I mentioned a few minutes ago about the great marketing growth debate and the yeah. four thought leaders on it. Um, one of the other people besides myself and Byron Sharp is going to be Kuhn's uh, advisor, Mike Hansen. Mike Hansen, yeah. Exactly. So, so he'll, he'll be uh, one of those four as well. So, uh, yeah. And obviously he and Kuhn are aligned in, in so many different ways. So it'll be really interesting to get his perspectives as well. Yes. There very much, and it's interesting you say so. You know, I did reach out to Mike as well, and he said, "Oh, we will indeed time, you know, time, find a time for for me to 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 come and speak here during one of the next events." So thanks, thanks for uh, for mentioning that, uh, Pete. Sure. Uh, along with slides, uh, you know, we have another, you know, you know, additional minutes um, uh, for for additional questions given uh, the schedule. So. Um, Feel free to step in if you have um, one question. Um, 
Uh, Pete is always looking for <laughs> questions. So yes, cool. We have mm -hmm. even have a, a lady question. Outstanding. Okay. So thanks, Christine, for stepping in. Not, not in French, okay, right, Peter? <laughs> uh, no, it's not. It's not. And you know, Kuhn, Kuhn speaks French. Uh, you know, we had a laugh about it. So you know, but no, not not in French that time. But you know, hopefully, I could probably translate for Pete. But I'm sure that Christine, you you speak a very good English. So. The, the stage is yours for a question, obviously. Yes, hi. Th thank you, Peter and, and Laurent. So maybe just a, a quick one and more maybe operation um, uh, oriented. So when, how could you, because I'm working mainly with retailers and, and restaurant chains, so how can you, or how can we optimize, you know, the loyalty programs uh, to make it more customer-centric? Because I feel like right now they are quite poor and more uh, transactional. So yeah. according to you, yeah, how, how, how to, to improve that? Oh, that's a great question, Christine. It, it lets me uh, show off something in, in my newer book. So th this one is less about what do we mean by customer centricity and more about how to implement the winning strategy. I have a lot to say about loyalty programs. And one of the reasons why loyalty programs don't work so well is because companies are using them the wrong way. So we have this cutesy little two by two diagram over here. I'm not sure how well you can see it. And the question is, in, in developing a loyalty program or some other kind of customer development tactic, are you trying to play offense or defense? And which kinds of customers is it aimed at? And here's the problem, especially on that latter issue. This is what loyalty programs should be doing. I mean, think about it this way. If someone comes down from Mars, and says, what is a loyalty program? And you try to describe it to them, it's going to be, well, you know, buy nine, get one free. You know, we just want you to buy a little bit more, right? So if you think about that as the essence of a loyalty program, who should a loyalty program be aimed at? And the answer would be the so-so customers. It's those customers who buy from you every now and again, but you want to get them to buy from you a little bit more. So loyalty programs should be aimed to get those customers who you know, kind of like you. They, they, they you know, they, they, you're not trying to um, recruit new ones necessarily, but trying to just, you know, get a little bit more value out of the the so-so ones that you have. The problem is that all too often people are lavishing resources on the top end customers. They're the ones who are going to keep buying from you anyway. You don't need to be throwing free stuff at them because they're, you know, for whatever reason, locked in. So people aren't managing loyalty programs particularly well because they're kind of missing that balance between the high end and the low end customers. I'm going to leave it at that, Christine, but it's, it's a really important point. And I wish that companies would be better, smarter about um, how they run their loyalty programs, what their intentions are, and of course, how they measure the impact of the loyalty program, what's the incremental profits that they get from them and which customers are contributing those incremental profits. Uh, I think they would start looking at things a little bit differently. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Sure thing. My pleasure. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Pete. We'll probably have time for one additional question. Um, um, if anyone wants to step in. Um, uh, I have one. And cool. uh, hi, I'm Beatrice. Uh, nice to meet you, Pete. Um, I'm, um, I'm working for uh, from the direct, direct selling environment. and. Um, where actually the, there's a misdefinition between customer and consumers. Uh, there's a kind of overlap in our business. So um, I, I was wondering what, what could be your advice uh, from recovering from this COVID uh, experience when we have this complexity in our business where you're talking not directly to consumers, but you're talking to first a customer, which might be a Salesforce uh, environment. Great question. And, and that's why I, I pick my words carefully. I'm talking about customer centricity, not consumer centricity. And there are so many businesses where the customer isn't the consumer uh, and they kind of mix that up. Uh, and so, uh, so very, very often, I mean, my favorite definition would be it's the entity that we're selling directly to. And so, for instance, I mentioned pharmaceuticals before, and so many of them come to me and say, so should we be focusing on patients or physicians? And I will tend to say physicians. Let's win over physicians first because we have that direct relationship with them. Um, and then, you know, I'm not saying we should ignore patients, but, but, but let's, let's deal with those kind of direct customers first and foremost uh, while 
we continue to build out relationships with those, uh, with those end users as well. So the good news is that the patterns look the same. So even if we're doing this in a B2B setting, that those you know, distribution partners that we're selling to will continue to follow that crazy shape distribution. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, I, I lean towards those who we deal with as opposed to those who are using the product. But in, at the same time, encourage companies to try to create lines of communication, whether it's through loyalty programs, mobile apps, and so on, to try to get to, to better understand those end users as well. But, but for most companies right now, it's going to be the, 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 the distribution partner. Great point. Thanks, John. Thank you, uh, Beatrice. Thank you, Pete. Um, uh, I guess we're coming nearly to an end, unless, uh, you know, I guess, Pete, you have another five minutes or not? Well, I could go on for days about this stuff, but, but know, you, know, know. You, you all have been uh, asking some, some wonderful questions. And, and let me just kind of give the, the um, other part of, of, of the answer to Beatrice's question. Uh, the, the other natural one that comes up isn't only, you know, customer versus consumer, but B2B versus B2C. And as I implied, but didn't say explicitly, the same patterns, when we look at, at in a B2B setting, uh, I'm gonna run the same exact model. I don't care if I'm looking at the digitally native men's underwear company or the enterprise SaaS software company. Uh, it's still, we're acquiring customers, they're staying with us, they're doing things, they're spending money. So the basic models that I'm gonna build and the way that I pull them together and the conclusions that I reach, it's gonna be the same thing. And that's one of the things I like about CBCV is that it really is the great equalizer. And I think it's applicable to pretty much any business, anywhere, anytime, and it helps us create that kind of conversation. It's not just for you know, fast moving consumer goods or something like that. Thank you, Pete. Um, maybe we're coming to an end of, uh, you know, at least today. Um, so obviously I wanna, you know, I wanna thank our, our, I wanna thank our guest, uh, Pete. Um, I hope we're not gonna be seeing each other uh, in the next, uh, you know, we're not gonna be waiting for 20 years, although we met a couple of times in between. And thanks, Pete. Uh, Pete was, uh, as all the people I very, very easily reach out, was very much willing to actually uh, step in and give some his time. So thanks very much for the very insightful, um, you know, outline. Um, I don't know if, um, you know, I guess I did attend some, um, some webinars or not some webinars, but some in-class sessions of Pete at Wharton. I don't know if you, when, if times comes by to normal, when I say normal, if we're allowed to, to travel again, I uh, remember having uh, attending also with um, a, a session um, with Pete and uh, Bruce Hardy uh, from London Business School. Uh, so I don't know if you may be considering that in the, you know, in the near future, uh, you know, as time gets by uh, to uh, maybe come to, to Paris for, for a session and a full, full in-depth session about model, models, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, uh, Pete does that from time to time and, it'll be, and I'm sure if there is an interest and um, a, a will and we are a sufficient number of people willing to, uh, to fly him in and uh, get, get things going, uh, we may have a chance to have Pete um, when times get back to normal. We'll see. That's another um, um, subject. Ho hopefully, you had a good uh, set of uh, questions that will hopefully enhance your will uh, to uh, to come back to Paris at some point, uh, Pete. Um, sure, it doesn't take much to, to get me back over there. By the way, if, if anyone's interested, uh, the, the, the kind of workshop that Laurent just referred to by Bruce Hardy and myself, uh, we're going to be doing one with uh, uh, with the folks at um, IE University in, in Madrid yeah. in November, hoping that I might be able to fly there and do it uh, live. Every day is looking less likely, but even if it's virtual, um, okay. uh, we'll be sure to, to send Laurent some information yeah, about it to share with others. Maybe we can, sure. you know, maybe we can, uh, we know, we can we'll potentially do find out find out about doing a back to back, or you know, if. Um, um, that's that's cool, and uh, yep. that would be a good chance to reconnect with uh, Bruce as well. Absolutely, so, cool, <laughs> outstanding. Um, with that said, uh, again, thank you, Pete. Thanks everyone for 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 you know your presence and quantity is not the key, but we've been listening. But quality is the key here. So thanks for being so um, so present here, uh, along with line. Uh, 
I just want to highlight something, you know, um, you know, I've been, uh, you know, very nicely again. Uh, if you guys will want to listen more about some of the stuff that uh, Bill has been speaking about regarding customer-based uh, evaluation of companies, corporate evaluation, Dan McCarty just wrote back to me uh, today. Uh, Dan McCarty is, um, I guess, um, probably one of the former students of Pete, or so he was working with Eric Bradlow, I guess, uh, and um, co-founder of the, the company. So he will be he's, he's willing to step in to speak to speak more about about that in the coming future. But the next speaker will, that will come is an old friend as well that you probably know, Pete. It's Jakob Goldenberg uh, from uh, from uh, Hebrew University, a visiting professor at Columbia University, and uh, Jakob will be available with us. He's roughly in the same time zone. Will speak on July 9th at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. So as I mentioned that for you to pencil in the, the, the time and date and pass that on along to your con 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 contacts. Uh, and uh, with that said, uh, thanks again, Pete. Thanks again, everyone. I'm just going to be uh, sending, um, you know, I think the, the uh, 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 feedback um, form was just sent to you. Uh, not to evaluate, but to get some insights about how was how you felt about the session, and uh, I will pass along that to uh, to Pete. Um, our NPS has been so far uh, not 80 or 84, uh, but has been over I think 65 or 70, which was not bad at all. So I'm sure that Pete will uh, will get more than that. With that said, again, thank you very much, Pete. Thanks everyone, and we'll be in touch soon, Pete. Um, and again, thank you very much. Hopefully, I'll, I'll come and visit when time allows uh, in Philly. Okay. You and everybody else. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Pete. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye now. Bye bye.